<clears throat> okay, um, so today, uh, December 5th, 2021, we will pay homage to three architects, Lina Bobardi, Ricardo Bofil, and uh, Yakov Chernikov. I will begin with Lina Bobardi, a remarkable, remarkable, remarkable architect. Uh, here she is. Uh, as a young woman, uh, uh, and uh, she was trained, she lived and she was born in Italy. Uh, she was trained in Italy, but in 1945, she made a, uh, a trip to Brazil together with her husband and didn't come back because after the war, the situation in, in Italy was rather tense and she was um, uh, part of the resistance uh, and uh, she also was involved with the Communist Party. She was a, an activist and uh, she started a new life in, in Brazil. But we'll read about her. So Lina Bobardi, born Aquilina Bo on December 5th, 1914, was an Italian-born Brazilian modernist architect. A prolific architect and designer, she devoted her working life, most of it spent in Brazil, to promoting the social and cultural potential of architecture and design. While she studied under radical Italian architects, she quickly became intrigued with Brazilian vernacular design and how it could influence a modern Brazilian architecture. During her lifetime, it was difficult to be accepted among the local Brazilian architects because she was both a so-called foreigner and a woman. She is recognizable for the unique style of the many architectural illustrations she created over her lifetime, along with her tendency to leave poignant notes to herself. She is also known for her furniture and jewelry designs. The popularity of her works has increased since 2008, when a 1993 catalog of her works was republished. A number of her product designs are being revived an exhibition such as her 1968 exhibition of glass and concrete easels have been created. In October 1986, Bobardi and her husband, sorry, I, I said 1945, actually 1946, Bobardi and her husband traveled to South America because they had participated in the Italian resistance movement that, that they found uh, life in post-war Italy difficult. In Rio, they were received <clears throat> by the IAB, Institute of Brazilian Architects. Bardi quickly re-established her practice in Brazil, a country which had a profound effect on her creative thinking. She and her husband co-founded the influential art magazine Habitat. The magazine's title referenced Bardi's conceptualization of the ideal interior as a habitat designed to maximize the human potential. And she, here she is, uh, probably on her way towards um, uh, her new country, towards Brazil. Some drawings. Uh, I love her drawings because they are certainly not the drawings of the typical architect. Now, what architect today would, would draw like this? But she did, and she is very, very valued uh, for, uh, for uh, her role in, in, in modern architecture. In fact, this is a, um, a so-called rendering for the Museum of Contemporary Art that she built. Um, I think it's in Sao Paulo. And, uh, but look at, the, look at the, the animation in front of an otherwise, uh, you know, obviously modern, modernistic building. What an imagination and what a freedom and what an innocence, you know, is this kind of thing would not be accepted in our schools at all. Look, or this kind of drawing, it would be considered uh, unskillful, uh, you know, uh, infantile, uh, banal and whatever. That's because we lost the pleasure of living and working creatively at the same time. Look another rendering by her, you know, uh, well, underneath the Museum of Contemporary Art that I mentioned. 
you know, it's a collage. She introduced some sculptures and so on, but also her, you know, her um, the human figures and so on. Another drawing, you know. <laughs> I love her drawings and she was a remarkable architect and we are going to see her buildings and her furniture. But she drew like a child in a way because she was thinking and because she was genuine and because she didn't try to imitate uh, someone else's manner of drawing. She was herself, in other words, like she was herself here. Where are the students to tell them these things, to be themselves and to stop copying a certain manner that became almost official, dogmatically official in our schools? Where are they? Look at this, one of the greatest architects of the 20th century. Look how she drew. Why she drew like this? Because she valued life more than architecture, although she served life with her architecture exactly because she loved life first. <sighs> Pirelli, Fiat, Mapping. Anyway, uh, the social poetry drawing of Lina Bobardi, somebody, not me, somebody had this title relating to her drawings, which I just discovered on the Google images. And here are sketches, you know, sketches of her uh, this was a thinking architect. Look at the plan here and look at some of the, she didn't want to impress with the standard or, uh, you know, uh, how to say, uh, not cutting edge, but the mainstream, uh, uh, you know, renderings. No, she was a thinking architect, but also with an artistic sensibility, which refused to be dwarfed by dogma and manner. She was genuine, in other words, and the drawing shows it. All the techniques they teach in schools should be totally banished because they only teach students what, how not to be themselves. When, when Bruce Goff wrote to Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright to ask them for advice when he was 16, uh, what school of architecture to follow? Louis Sullivan uh, said, uh, said, to, said to him, uh, stay away from schools of architecture. It took me many years to forget what I learned in school. And Frank Lloyd Wright told him the same thing, but in a different way. He said, if you go to, to an architecture school, you'll, you'll uh, lose Bruce Goff, meaning himself. But are we listening to Frank Lloyd Wright and to Louis Sullivan? Of course not. After all, they were just the two architects, part of the, you know, uh, almost uh, sacred trinity of uh, modern North American architecture. The third one being H. H. Richardson, an architect no one talks about here and no student knows about. An architecture of perfect imperfection. This is how this Martin Filler, I don't know who he is, maybe a critic. Anyway, that's how he described the achievement of uh, uh, Lina Bobardi, an architecture of perfect imperfection. Beautiful, beautiful. What could be more perfect than the perfect imperfection? Lina Bobardi, born Achillina Bo, coming back, I had another short text about this, was an Italian born Brazilian modernist architect, a prolific architect and designer. Lina Bobardi devoted her working life most of it spent in Brazil. Here is a celebration, uh, Lina Bobardi, I don't know where, maybe uh, somewhere in Brazil. Anyway, radical pedagogies, Lina Bobardi's theory of an immediate life architecture from 1957. Uh, it's true, I, I have a liking for uh, radical uh, anything. You know, because those who are true radicals are actually true to, to the beauty of life and to the complexity of life. So let's read a little a bit about this. Arch Daily is continuing our partnership. I don't know anyway that, that our belongs to a context which I don't have here very explicitly posted with radical pedagogies, an ongoing multi-year collaborative research 
project led by Beatrice Colomina with a team of PhD students of the School of Architecture at Princeton University, presenting a series of paradigmatic cases in architectural education. Beatrice Colomina uh, uh, is a very important theoretician uh, about architecture at Princeton. And her husband is um, Mark Wigley, who was the dean at Columbia University for about 15 years. And he was the curator of the exhibition Deconstructivist Architecture. Uh, in this fourth example of radical pedagogies in Latin America, Vanessa Grossman, PhD candidate in history and theory of architecture at Princeton presents Lina Bobardi's application for a chair at the Faculty of Architecture and Urban Studies of the University of Sao Paulo. Although the application was rejected by the faculty commission, the submitted essay still is a sing singular source of new ideas for architectural education. This explains, of course, the, the immense interest in, in this presentation today um, that, uh, you know, made so many being present here now. Uh, this is the um, contribution I can read in Portuguese anyway, you understand. 1957, um, Lina Bobardi. Uh, here she is in her own house, in her own home, uh, a modernistic house that per perhaps today would not uh, impress us a lot, but uh, at that time when it was built, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it meant something. Uh, she advocated the theory of an immediate life architecture. Here she is in a, uh, you know, probably, you know, uh, some suffering uh, came to her as it, it comes to all of us. Uh, but uh, you can tell a sensitive woman and uh, uh, not arrogant at all. The glass house from 1951, we already saw an image, uh, Bardi's residence. Here it is in a more recent picture. Um, what can we say? You know, it's it's for now. It 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 doesn't look uh, you know extremely extremely uh, you know, interesting, perhaps. But uh, that time, uh, I guess its modernism was uh, rather new, and certainly in Brazil. At the center of the house is this courtyard within which the tree is the, you know, the, in a way, the axis mundi. I wonder how she felt, you know, uh, I mean, still uh, immigration or immigration are, are not easy, you know, exile is not easy. Maybe she was in this picture, maybe she was thinking of her beloved Italy, because I'm sure she loved Italy. She was born there, she grew up there. Anyway, uh, so this is her own house uh, built in 1951. This is not her. You can see here, she's long by Le Corbusier, or should I say Charlotte Perion, or both. This uh, large uh, glass uh, part of the world makes me think of Louise Paragon uh, a little. Maybe students in architecture and architects visiting her house, or maybe not just architects. The tree. Uh, 
not a very small house actually. But we will see another house she built for herself, much more modest, and in a way almost vernacular. Splendid tree. Trees are usually splendid, and uh, I, I have seen some uh, some books there that uh, make me curious and even envious. Now, Bobardi Studio in Sao Paulo from 1986, and this is the other building that I wanted to uh, to to show. Uh, you see, it's it's a different kind of building. It's not it's not any longer that modernistic, uh, you know structure is something else here but i like this one even more i think i actually like this more than uh, than the other one here she is in a chair she designed we are going to we saw some drawings here there she is you know, with a computer, um, all by herself. I'm sure she didn't have, uh, you know, employees, so to speak. Another chair she designed. She was an excellent designer of furniture, truly. I mean, her, her furniture pieces are exquisite. Now, very simple, but not simplistic. We saw already this picture. A sugar mill converted to a craft museum in Bahia. Um, so the building is not um, hers, she just did a conversion. I love this stair. It's beautiful, you know. I mean, just for this stair, and uh, she would have deserved to be celebrated today on her birthday. Happy birthday, Lina! It's really, you see, with with simple means, in a way, she created a, a masterpiece of uh, logic, <clears throat> of sensitivity, of uh, you know, uh, structure, of. Uh, you know, aesthetical innovation uh, of everything with the simplest means in a way. Well, if we call using solid, uh, massive wood, the simplest way, but I am sure Brazil uh, had and has plenty of wood. I like very much this. You see, it became a sculpture, a sculpture, but a sculpture that is very, uh, you know, usable. Yes, it doesn't have a parapet, and the functionalists would uh, protest, but I think it's a beautiful step. You see clearly how it is made. It's not hiding anything. And it's very coherent.
this reminds me a little bit of Jeannie Gang, who admires a lot Lina Bobardi. Uh, and uh, her first work was actually a staircase in, 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 the, in the house where she rented an apartment. Uh, <laughs> interesting uh, dialogue over, over the years. Again, the thinking architect who didn't have to produce, uh, you know, spectacular renderings or anything. The simple means he be, she built uh, uh, an impressive stair. Here she is with, uh, with her cat. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's move forward. Uh, house built between 1958 and 1964. A beautiful house, truly, you know, I mean, I like this one again more than the round first house that we saw. Uh, you know, this is about the art of living, appreciating simple things, <clears throat> appreciating the beauty of a place and uh, trying them to make the best of it. Now here she is on a, on a you know, uh, <laughs> inspection, uh, maybe on her own building. Anyway, Teatro Officina, Lina Bobardi. I love this theater too, because it's, it's uh, uh, almost an uh, anti-architecture, but by being an almost anti-architecture, it becomes architecture. Again, she valued life the most, and in this case, theater the most, because this was the, you know, the, the, the raison d'etre for, for this uh, building. And, and uh, again, it's, it's, it's not trying to impress at all. And it's, it, it's truly a social art. She advocated architecture as a social art and uh, the social concerns she had, let's not forget, she was, um, you know, involved with communism in, uh, in Italy is shown here too, you know, a democratic uh, art, you know, without uh, any interest to embellish anything for the bourgeois. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a mechanism for, um, you know, equality and for uh, art, art matters. And, uh, you know, how exactly the, the building functions, uh, you know, uh, with simple means again, you know, it's something very beautiful, I think, in this, because there is hope in this. And this is like a new beginning. Anyone can, can stand up there and, and watch, um, you know, uh, some play being performed in a space which uh, the professionals would think inadequate. Well, the building existed. She just uh, created uh, the interior for this function. And I think uh, she did an excellent job uh, without any need for uh, impressing uh, uselessly and expensively. And things function, and we are going to see other works of hers in the same spirit. You would almost say, where is the architect? Well, even Gemma Cantacuzino said, no, you, why the architect should um, leave uh, his creation on his tiptoes and, um, you know, uh, would, uh, would disappear without leaving, uh, you know, a strong, uh, you know, fingerprint or anything, you know, uh, an arrogant one usually. Now, here is, uh, you almost say the architect was not there, but she was. She was, and I think what she did is, is in a way, timeless. It's, it's not pretentious. It's not trying to impose any style or anything. You know, in, in a way, it's very radical. It's also about art as process and architecture's process. You know, it's not frozen in, um, you know, uh, rigid uh, configurations. No, it's, it's, it's literally doing the most with the least without the, 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 the desire to monumentalize anything. Look, look how she did the, the, the parapets on these stairs. It's, it's, 
in my opinion, is great. It, re I, it reminds me a little bit of the public bathroom in the uh, La Tourette, uh, Monastère La Tourette by Le Corbusier. I spent a night there and I, 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 I took a shower one day there and I have to say, I'm not the kind of man to become enthusiastic or exuberant about a bathroom. But that bathroom was magnificent, kind of in this spirit, done with the simplest means, almost arte povera, but in, in some ways magnificent. I remember in the in the in the shower room, you know, even if you had your eyes closed, you would have known where to put your towel or your your soap. Or I, I, I don't know, it was almost magic, done with the simplest means. And you can see here, the actor and the dog seem to enjoy themselves. And it's life. If I look at this, it's, it's really about life. It's not about, uh, you know, the building uh, telling you, look at me. No, this is about life. And, uh, you know, the building is just, uh, you know, uh, a device to make life possible. Great. I love it. And look, <laughs> the theater takes place. And of course, I'm jealous of these people that they are all together and I'm unable to stir up the um, mammoth monolithical indifference that surrounds me. No, I can't. I can't. I don't know exactly why I can't, but I can't. Theater and life, or should I say life and theater and architecture is uh, the last one to say I'm present, but exactly because it's the last one somehow uh, deserves to take our heads off in front of it because it's almost absent. It's a, almost an unarchitecture. So he's telling me that there is no money to do uh, you know, important things. He's totally wrong. We can do with it. We just need the imagination and generosity and to, and to, and to perceive the beauty of imperfection the perfection of imperfection. Now, Lina Bobardia, this is another great work by her in Pompeii, 1982. Uh, look what she did here. She again worked within an existing context with existing buildings. And uh, <laughs> look at these you know, windows here, these openings in the concrete wall. And then these, um, you know, uh, bridges between the two uh, the, the the two buildings i think is it is excellent a look at the, the window from the inside nice since i told you i i, I am preparing a powerpoint presentation about architecture and play and i began it and now i'm thinking to actually present a, an incredible architect from south korea Moon Hoon, uh, uh, truly a very, very special architect. And uh, there is an image of him with the, you know, kind of uh, in, in, the, in the opening of a wall, so-called imperfect like this one. Very, very nice. I can't wait to talk about Moon Hoon, with whom I had an exchange of emails that um, uplifted me a lot. A remarkable architect, Moon Hoon. Yeah, I will talk about him two days from now on the seventh. Um, anyway, this is, a, this is another very interesting work by Lina Bobardi and uh, him, you know, who taught her architecture? I don't know, maybe God. Uh, she had training in architecture, but um, you know, we talk about her and we don't talk about her teachers. Why are we talking about her? Because she's relevant, that's why. I mean, what we look at here is uh, as relevant for us today as it was, uh, you know, 40 years ago. This is, uh, this is an architecture that is, uh, you know, highly relevant today. Look at these, um, these uh, bifurcations. 
this the duality of these um, passageways, the bridges. You know, it's it's art here. It's movement. It's life. The redness of the the in, the openings into the concrete walls. Uh, even the you know ventilation devices and so on you know everything is is done with the simplest means in the in the truest way and uh, i think it's 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 a good word some might call it brutalist but uh, if the truth is brutal let it be brutal dina bobardi this is not an architecture for the bourgeois no this is an architecture for those who like truth. architecture or architectural space a social catalyst and this is what it is it's a social catalyst A drawing, another beautiful drawing by Lina Bobardi. And you can see on this drawing, uh, you know, strange animals or not so strange. And it's the carnival of life. You know, again, what school of architecture would accept this kind of drawing in its uh, curricula? None, probably, or some exotic schools in Great Britain like Bartlett or uh, AA or maybe sci Arc in Los Angeles, but uh, <laughs> art is beautiful when it tells the truth and when it is, it is non-conformist. And this is non-conformist. Again, who would put in a project, an architectural project, uh, over-dimensioned uh, little insect, which is not so little any longer, or, uh, you know, she found inspiration where one would uh, least expect it. You know, uh, but uh, I see so much hope in, in, in such a graphic notation, if I can call it so. Bravo to her. And here is a chair designed by her and built by her. You see how it was built. No mystery. <laughs> she even drew the, you know, the the nails or the, you know, the, oh, the oh, I forgot how they are called. Uh, anyway, back to that architectural project, which is so contemporary. I mean, what she did here is a is a masterpiece of uh, contemporary architecture. Hello, happy birthday to you, Lina Bobardi. Don't be sad. You are not alone. We are with you together with you from over uh, you know across the ocean yes we are don't be sad we aren't too many <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <laughs> so 
look, you know, it doesn't matter where you look from, you discover interesting things architecturally done with the simplest means. Well, concrete, yes, it, it pollutes. But at that time, there wasn't so much concern with the pollution of uh, concrete, but it's, it's, you know, this is abstract architecture and abstract art at its best. Another picture with her, we saw her in the, and this is a view from the inside of that building. Why did she make, uh, Jean Nouvel is doing sometimes this kind of windows now. Valina Bobardi did them with almost half a century earlier. The Sao Paulo Museum of Art, of which I mean, I, I showed uh, uh, some drawings. Uh, here it is built the redness of passion, the redness of love, the redness of an engaged and engaging art. One that doesn't leave people indifferent, that one that wakes them up. This is the conceptualization of the, of the project. You know, it's, Again, it's alarmingly simple, but no simplistic. The Sao Paulo Museum of Art, a paper model. So although she lived rather modestly, especially in her later years, and you know, uh, she showed uh, great interest in uh, you know fantastic little insects and so on. She was quite capable of achieving a monumental architecture. Make you look at the scale of these red pillars or these red uh, stairways, reminding me a little bit of Odile Deck in our time. Bravo to her, bravo Lina. because redness is the color of action and uh, movement and uh, you know the diagonal as well so here we have it not only is it it is an, a, a diagonal but it's also red or reddish so the it amplifies it intensifies the need for action for a, a dynamic involvement with the life within the building itself So the immigrant received uh, an important commission in the capital of Brazil, Sao Paulo. And yes, underneath the market, why not? Like in old times, you know, there were markets, you know, in front of the cathedral. Here is underneath the cathedral. Well, the cathedral of art. Nice. Nice again, because it's about life first and foremost. I never saw such a life underneath uh, l'unité d'habitation by Le Corbusier. But here is, is, well, it's also located differently and it's not an apartment building, but uh, I like to imagine that Le Corbusier imagined something like this underneath his, um, you know, four um, unité d'habitation that he built. It's not, it's not an arrogant building. Sometimes contemporary art could be arrogant, but her building is not arrogant. It's uh, courageous, but not arrogant. And it's very simple again, but not simplistic.
somehow she was able to uh, achieve in her building uh, or her buildings what was shown in her you know so-called infantile drawings the, the the spirit and the life of her drawings is uh, matched by what we see in these pictures and we have the same feeling that is really about life first perhaps she would have reversed the the you know the latin saying ars longa, long, ars longa vita previs she probably would have said vita longa ars previs although she laughed at we saw this beautiful drawing now she wrote about the stones against diamonds she valued stones more than diamonds and this must be her that here she was a sophisticated architect a brilliant architect who thought that stones are more important than diamonds and i i am on, with her on this i i believe the same thing unfortunately the bourgeois and most people value more diamonds because they value luxury they don't love truth and depth they love luxury so they love diamonds the more expensive the better well she thought that stones are against uh, against and should be against the diamonds and let's read about this this collection of essays is the first ever english anthology of her writings i think this was published by aa in london it, it includes texts written when she was still living in italy as well as later contributions to a number of brazilian newspapers journals and magazines an acute critic and a creative thinker bobardi proposes a series of new parameters for design thinking and practice such as the notions of historical present roughness and tolerance to imperfection presented collectively the texts present a wealth of inspirational thoughts articulated in a refreshingly simple straightforward fashion historical present roughness and tolerance to imperfection i like all three of them first the historical present i think i think what we call history if it is not valid today it deserves not to talk about because history has has relevance only in as much as it continues into the present and also into the future i keep saying what 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 matters what what matters from the past doesn't pass and uh, <laughs> you know in a way with this is what i'm trying to do here talk to about architects who yes died but they didn't die well some of them they are still relevant they are still present so in the historical present now roughness the roughness of the stone vis-a-vis -vis the diamond to love roughness is to love truth even zaha hadid she claimed she she stated that she wanted an architecture that was raw meaning graph earthy and vital well maybe some of her buildings were vital to an extent but they were never raw and they were never earthy tolerance to imperfection this is another generous uh, you know desideratum or desiderata to be tolerant to imperfection meaning means to welcome life beyond the you know the stiff inhibited and inhibiting so called perfectionist and i was one myself at one time here she is again uh, probably on the boat towards brazil we saw this picture already uh, another picture of her in the book that was published with her thoughts on um, you know his, the historical present roughness and the tolerance to imperfection you see the title of, uh, of a book stones against diamonds bravo lina we saw this drawing already here she is again 
Yes, we saw this one. Now, Santa Maria dos, dos, dos Anjos Chapel. It's a chapel, a beautiful chapel. Uh, why aren't there here any theologians who disfigure our country with the <laughs> dogmatic and dead buildings? This is a simple building that didn't cost a lot at all, but it has that genuine uh, simplicity the true spirit has. We don't need anything more, actually. Uh, it is a chapel. And, uh, you know, I, I would oppose it even to Ronchamp, you know. Uh, yes, this is a building that does not want to impress. And, uh, and yet it impresses exactly because of its, you know, attempted uh, 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 non-impressive uh, status. What could be simpler? But what could be more effective, actually? And where the altar is, is, you know, you have two windows, left and right, you know, and uh, it's very, very simple, but I don't think it is simplistic. It's oriented properly, you see, uh, well, approximately properly, east is here. But, uh, and you enter, uh, you know, from Southwest, it's okay. It has the dignity of a, what we call a sacred space, but it's a sacred space which does not want to describe itself as being so-called sacred. No, it doesn't need to, it doesn't have to. Even when it was uh, unkept, like in this picture, I still think it had a quiet monumentality. In its silence, in my opinion, the building still had and has dignity. Is something else. Um, so uh, a view from the inside. Again, what could be simpler? This is almost a chapel, a parallel of uh, Men Without Qualities by Robert Musi. You say it's a, it's a, it's a chapel without qualities, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, sometimes the one who appears to be without qualities has more quality than uh, uh, many things or entities or people who, which uh, claim to have a lot of qualities, but uh, are, they are, in my opinion, often quite uh, overvalued. Here yeah, she is doing some work, uh, you know, uh, with her own hands, just like Maya Lin for the uh, Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. Lina Bobardi's Valeria Cirelli's house built very few years after Lina's glass house, a very solid house in comparison to the glass one, the glass house. Yes, I, I like this architecture very much, you know, the vernacular modernism that she promoted, if we can call it so. It's more, uh, you know, archetypal and uh, atemporal than, but there is a certain modernist too, you know, uh, a modernist beyond style, beyond dogmas, beyond I don't know how many points, you know, with uh, we know what we are referring to here. Um, great building, we saw it before actually, but here we see more pictures. Now, of course, it held, it is held by the beautiful uh, landscape around it. And now we end this presentation on her work with a with a work which was neglected and uh, I don't know vandalized if I can say so by the elements and by who knows who, 
but there was a, there was a quest for money uh, to 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 donate money in order to bring this building uh, back to life and this is the power of the spirit this is the power of, uh, of, a, of a gesture in in art or in architecture which endures and endures and at one moment it makes people want to help because there is something worthy of being preserved and uh, i don't know exactly what she was doing here but i find it um, interesting and uh, you know enticing and let's hope this thing was was taken care of i read uh, an announcement i think in, in at, uh, either bartlett or the architectural association there was an announcement that they were you know uh, accepting donations to restore this uh, this building by lina bobardi you see the Lina Bobardi Fellowship 2016 open call applications are now open for the fourth and final round of the Lina Bobardi uh, Fellowship. Another drawing, we saw the chair actually, maybe with her sitting on it. Uh, here she is. I think this is the last picture of this uh, imperfect presentation. Uh, Please don't be sad, Ms. Uh, Bardi or Bo Bardi. Um, we think of you. We came from far away to wish you happy birthday. And uh, we do so with uh, all the worms we are capable of. Happy birthday to you. OK, and now let's go to the second architect, uh, a Spaniard, uh, a very different architect. It's true. Uh, Ricardo Bofill. Let's read a little bit about him. Ricardo Bofill Levy uh, is a Spanish architect. He's actually um, 82 years old today. Happy birthday to you, Mr. Bofill. He founded Ricardo Bofill Taller de Arquitectura in 1963. So he was uh, 24 years old, uh, quite young and developed it into a leading international architectural and urban design practice. According to architectural historian Andrew Ayers, his creations rank among the most impressive buildings of the 20th century. But he's also described as a misfit architect. Uh, we'll look at his buildings. I, I, I will show uh, quite a number of his buildings. But let's read more. So born in, in late 1939, so just before Second World War, and just after the end of the Spanish Civil War, Ricardo Bofill grew up in a well-to-do family with deep Catalan and Bar Barcelonese roots. His grandfather, Joseph Maria Bofill y Pichot, P Pichot, had been involved in, a pro in proeminent local institutions such as the Institute for Catalan Studies, the Catalan Institute of Natural History, and the Royal Academy of Sciences and Arts of Barcelona. His father, Emilio Bofill, was an architect, builder, and developer who studied at the Escola Tecnica Superior de Arquitectura de Barcelona, Barcelona, Catalonia's oldest professional architecture school. Ricardo Bofill would later describe himself as Republican, liberal, progressive, austere, and logical. Ricardo's mother, Maria Levy, or Levi Levy, uh, was an Italian of Jewish descent born in Venice, who became a preeminent sponsor of Catalan literature and culture in post-war Barcelona. Bofill studied at the Lycée Francais de Barcelone, he spent much of his youth traveling, first with his family and later on his own, and developed a passion for vernacular architecture. I don't know, some of these texts on Wikipedia are a little bit, uh, uh, you know, shaky in my opinion, but uh, I still use them because they are easy to use. His first project was a summer house in Ibiza, completed in 1960. That year, he enrolled at the, at the Escola Tecnica Superior de Arquitectura de Barcelona, where his father studied, where he engaged in student activism 
with the unauthorized Unified Socialist Party of Catalonia. Beautiful. So he was rebellious. In 1958, he was arrested in a demonstration and expelled from the university and from Spain. He moved to Switzerland and completed his formal architectural training at the Haute Ecole d'Art et de Design Genève. In 1963, Ricardo Bofil and group of close and a group of close friends created Ricardo Bofil Taller de Arquitectura or Ricardo Bofil Architecture Workshops, initially hosted in his father's construction business with offices on Plaza de Catalunya in the center Barcelona. Building on Catalan traditions of craftsmanship, he enlisted architects and engineers, but also writers, artists, and into a multidisciplinary effort, which later branched into urban design and urban planning. The team experimented on original methodologies based on three-dimensional modular geometries, such as those of the Gaudi district in Reus, 1964-1970, El Castillo de Kafka, in San per de Ribs, above Sitges, Xanadu, and La Muraja uh, Roja in Calp. We are going to see these works. The same thinking was developed on a larger scale with the project La Ciudad, La Ciudad en el Espacio, the city in space, whose construction started in the Moratalas uh, area of Madrid in 1970, but was abruptly stopped by Francoist Mayor Carlos Arias Navarro. It was instead realized with the construction of Walden 7 in San Just, near Barcelona, 1970-1975. These projects were recognized as exemplars of critical regionalism, I kind of doubt this, and can be viewed as a reaction against both architectural modernism and the Francoist dictatorship of Spain. But it has to be said, at that time, uh, in the early 70s, he and together, together with uh, Taller de Arquitectura, his office, declared that for them, Magritte, the surrealist uh, Belgian painter, was more important than Miss van der Rohe. I wouldn't bring here, uh, you know, so-called uh, critical re regionalism. Uh, I, I think it's a little bit of force, that statement. Here is Mr. Bofil, uh, seductive even in his uh, older age. Uh, another picture of him uh, doing well for himself. Uh, and um, what can we say? Too bad he moved to Paris. In my opinion, he, his uh, going to Paris was fatal to him. But in this uh, picture, as a young man, he does look seductive. It's hard not to like him. And uh, I'm sure those who offer him commissions also like him. So let's look first at his own office, which was in a, in a factory, former factory, and is one of the most beautiful architectural offices I have ever seen. I mean, I only saw it from a distance, but I admire it from that distance. And uh, I wish I lived and worked in such a place. I don't think there is a better architecture office than this one. The, it is uh, remarkable in, in many ways. It is brutal, it is sensitive, it is romantic, it is gothic, it is everything. It is, you know, it is a place of, uh, of, uh, of everything, you know. It's, it's, it has uh, tall ceilings and it has great, uh, you know, uh, giant uh, curtains and interesting windows. And uh, what can we say? You can only create a fantastic architecture in this space. Why he left for Paris is, um, is, is probably the, the, the mistake of his life because his architecture changed there and for the worse. But while he was here near Barcelona and in Barcelona, they built some incredible buildings, which I think are very relevant for us today. Also, at that time, he was a revolutionary to an extent. Well, a special revolutionary because he was affluent, he had money, he had the support of the construction company of his father, 
and he had this beautiful office at his disposal. I mean, you know, this is a, the, you know, the stage for a win-win situation. You know, and there is also the ruin, you know, to make you melancholy and to make you have a more complex thinking and a more poetical uh, turn of mind. Uh, so um, it makes me think also a little bit when I look at this of Lina Bobardi now, now, now interest in finishes in, 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 you know, in plastering the walls, you know, in a bourgeois way. No, no, stones against diamonds. Although I think uh, Ricardo Bofill uh, liked diamonds too. And the beautiful nature, what can we say? Uh, 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 by far the best architecture office in the world. Well, there are others that are interesting, like uh, the Ruin Academy in Taiwan, which is also a remarkable school with a remarkable name, the Ruin Academy. They probably felt like uh, kings and queens and princes and princesses there. You know, how else would you imagine doing architecture in such an environment? In, in such an environment, which obviously admired the perfection of imperfection, to quote uh, from Lina Bobardi. You know, Louis, uh, uh, not Louis, sorry, uh, Jean Nouvel uh, said, uh, bring the office into the home and the home into the office. But if you can bring both into a factory or in a, in a you know, uh, abandoned factory, all for the better. And that's what he did. And this is what they did. Now, of course, not everybody can do something like this. You have to have money, influence, support, but they did something and they, they had progressive thinking at that time and you are going to see their buildings. And who inspired them? Magritte and the Surrealists, of course. Of course, not Ernest Neufer, and not even Miss. Uh, look at it, you know, a perfect place to do architecture. Who cared that, uh, you know, maybe many parts of this building uh, large building were not used in the strict sense of the word. It's okay. Why do we have to use everything? Well, in such an environment, as I said, you can only do interesting architecture. I wonder what he felt when he came to work or his colleagues. And let's remember, he, only, he didn't have only architects and engineers around him, but also writers, artists, and so on. A true multidisciplinary team. Animated by what? By uh, Macintosh, the author of these uh, thrones chairs, but also animated by idealism. Idealism, that's what we need. But, you know, I am preaching to very few people because the Romanian architect is not interested in idealism. He's interested in a little buck. The quicker it comes, the better. Doesn't matter the quality of the work, really. Look at this. This is also about culture. You look at this and you see art, you see paintings, you see books. Yes, the space is majestic. Uh, you see easels with drawings that they produced. Uh, yes, it, it was a space for uh, radical aristocrats in a way. 
non-conformists and some pieces of furniture, you know, descended probably from, uh, you know, the uh, Catalan uh, modernism. Very nice. We can only envy them, of course. And this is how it was before uh, the architects uh, took over it and uh, they didn't change too much, but uh, they inhabited uh, the ruin in a beautiful way and inspired way. Taller de Arquitectura and Ricardo Bofil. And soon we are going to look at some buildings they built very close to, to this great uh, working uh, quarters. And I think uh, some of the, uh, the seduction of this building derives exactly from the fact that some spaces are, don't have a specified function. And uh, maybe some of them are even uh, not functional in the, you know, the common sense of the word. So some spaces uh, are stirring up our imagination as they stirred up their imagination, I'm sure. It's big indeed. <laughs> this is not a you know a small apartment in a block of flats. No. It's for kings and queens and princes and princesses. And here we see one of the buildings they built, which is the Walden Seven, which is remarkable. Now let's look first at an earlier work. This uh, it's a block of flats in Barcelona, near Agua. 99, which I also think is excellent. Uh, less spectacular, perhaps, but uh, very well done with a clear knowledge of construction of the tectonics that uh, make architecture uh, meaningful. And uh, I wish I had more pictures with it, but maybe the next time I will have the chance to talk about Ricardo Bofil and Tala de Arquitectura, I will gather more pictures. But even this, in these two pictures, I think we can see uh, that it's about uh, uh, well assimilated and digested modernism. Another building, uh, sorry about the spelling there, I, I pasted, I copied and pasted the, the, the name and it's not correctly written. What I like here is that we have an, an architecture that belongs to the place it is in but it's also assuming uh, something that modernism rejected, and that is ornamentation. What else is here? It's ornamentation. It's a very good building. I just compare it with the building here. You know, uh, this is a higher level of architecture than what we see here. Now we arrive at the spectacular Walden 7 and spectacular it is, and look at this. You know, this is an architecture of courage. This is an architecture of vision. This is an architecture with social concerns. It is uh, expressing unity, but it's also expressing verity. And so it's multiplicity in unity. And in the foreground, of course, the citadel, the working place of these remarkable architects. It's monumental, but it's a monumentality which doesn't crush the individual because the individual is recognized through the small balconies and so on. And uh, we have the voids yesterday who looked at the atria or atriums of uh, John Portman. Here we have a different kind of atrium, but uh, uh, still a vertical space of some amplitude. Bravo to Taller de Arquitectura and, uh, and uh, Ricardo Bofil. Look at the interior. 
you know this this is again an architecture of dreamers but dreamers who also were concerned not just about their well not about their well-being but their uh, the, about society here was uh, a group of young architects coming together and working for uh, for um, you know social uh, uh, implementations of uh, of their dreams it seems luxurious but it's possible these these buildings were you know uh, made for uh, you know so called common people the spaces are small indeed but you don't need large spaces if you feel you belong because it's not just about the surface of your apartment it's also about belonging to uh, to a larger group and yet not be uh, um, you know de-individualized no uh, here we see the individual windows we see the the individual uh, unit the individual family but we also feel that there is something larger that unites all of this and there is uh, and it's a it's a it's a it's a magical architecture after all it's a block of flats that's what it is but let's compare it with the banality of most blocks of flats this is not banal and there is color and there are ceramic uh, works here and there you know and uh, it, it's 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 an architecture which uh, you know invites to imagination because it's itself, you know, um, built with imagination. Archeura Oniria. I don't know what that is, but uh, I can imagine it's 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 uh, it's an architecture which welcomes oniric or onirical uh, meanings. And uh, here are probably some architecture students, uh, probably, I don't know, I imagine, visiting the labyrinths of uh, Taller de Arquitectura and uh, Ricardo Bofil. Too bad he didn't continue on this line. In fact, I, I, I just saw before I started the presentation, a hotel he built in Barcelona rather recently and this is, it is as if it, it is not by the same man, by the same group, or I don't know what happened to them and to him. I keep saying, and I keep saying it to myself, architecture is beautiful if it is an adventure. And this was an adventure to build something like this, you know, it was not done before and it was not done after, not even by themselves. And it's not because I mean I'm not uh, I'm not advocating a repetition, no. But something happened. They kept creating some um, intriguing things, but uh, I think of some dubious character in in France, and we are going to see them. In a way, very rhetorical and very demagogical. To me, these buildings are not demagogical here in Barcelona, no. But those in France are because he tried to. Uh, achieve their so-called modern classicism and that was fatal to Taller de Arquitectura and to himself. In a way, you know, kind of connecting with another Catalan that is Salvador Dali, who uh, stated that he was bo both um, uh, 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 an anarchist and, uh, uh, you know, uh, an admirer of um, you know, uh, the emperor, he used a different word. In other words, he was a royalist, a royalist and an anarchist. Um, I, I am afraid that in the case of um, Taller de Arquitectura and Ricardo Bofil, after they moved to France, the royalist uh, took over the anarchist. Uh, but uh, if they are able to come back, even at this age of 82, to some uh, some anarchical uh, freshness, I think it would be better. They did a good work and we are going to see at the very end of this presentation, a uh, university in uh, Morocco, uh, but uh, that's a rather singular work that is uh, worthy really of being shown here. 
in my opinion. But this, this, uh, this spectacular apartment buildings I like. I like uh, repeating for the reason that there is the monolith, there is the unity, and then there is the individuality, the individual, the balcony, the you know the the many windows that 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 show you that this is about a, a multitude, about a, a multiplicity that needs to be recognized as a multiplicity, even within the larger unit or unity. This is the model of what uh, not everything was built. But what was built, I think, is convincing enough. Even if, as I said, the spaces are small. But, but you know, I, I don't think any leaf of a, of a magnificent tree is complaining that it is small compared to the tree in its um, wholeness. No, if you belong here to a larger, you know, even meaning to a larger unity, it doesn't matter your little room is small. I, I still think you feel a richness of belonging because actually richness has to do mostly with the relationships. If you belong to a, a context or something that transcends your own little being and yet you do not become de depersonalized, I think is, is okay. It's fine. You look, uh, if you can read this um, rather, you know, pale, uh, you know, uh, drawing, the spaces are not big, but you can tell that it was a communal kind of thinking that, you know, this, uh, this here is an apartment, here is another apartment, then uh, this is a, like a building, this is a, like a building, this is another building, and they are connected through balconies and stairways and so on. And then they are part of a, they are, they are like the cells of a larger organism. And still the plan is not telling you everything, you know, in its bidimensionality. They experiment. You know, there was a certain structuralism here, serialism, but because Magritte was in their minds, they welcomed the surreal dimension. There was also color, you know, and uh, there are sophisticated things here. And it, 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 I guess the way they worked with a, in a multidisciplinary team helped. You know, they, they crystallized a vision that was complex, that was rich in meaning, was rich visually. And uh, otherwise, if you look at the plans, you know, you wouldn't imagine actually the building as it came into being based just on the plan. Well, when you are beginning to see the section and you are seeing these huge, these giant uh, voids, things begin to change. Uh, and uh, they change for the better. But look, the, the, the apartments in themselves are small, but it's okay. And they are small and I would say, uh, you know, unconventional. Look at the sections. You know, uh, they, they are small, they are minimal, but uh, I think it's fine. I would live in such a space. I don't need, uh, because I know I, there is a, a bigness outside of me that I belong to. So I, I, I'm part of that bigness too. Uh, draw, the drawing's a little bit inspired by some sketches by Le Corbusier. Uh, Anyway, this was not done just by him, of course. I don't even know if he drew these things. This, they had, he had a team, a team of very inspired uh, and inspiring young people, and uh, they did. Uh, I am only trying to imagine how it was in their office, you know, with all those books and easels and chairs by Macintosh and plants and the monumentality of the remnants of the factory. Uh, <laughs> 
you know, it, it was an atmosphere of enthusiasm, of exuberance, of creating and recreating the world and of dreaming and implementing the dream. Kafka's castle, Barcelona, Spain, here it is. Uh, not very different in a way from the Habitat 67 in Montreal by Moshe Safdi, but still a little bit different. Uh, still the, the ethos, the social ethos of the 60s present in this work. And you see the plans are quite uh, minimal, you know, actually, but it works. It works and it is uh, enticing even through its name, Kafka's Castle. It's a labyrinth, welcoming the labyrinth and getting rid of the fatality of uh, rationalist, you know, belief in, uh, uh, you know, uh, lack of mysteries, because that's what we did in the name of the so-called so uh, rationalists. We killed mystery. We need Lucian Blaga. We need his, uh, uh, we need him badly. How can we bring back enthusiasm and exuberance in our lives? How? Getting rid of the, of the, of the, of the pathetic little mercantile uh, interests, really, that's how. Culture, dreaming, art, psychology, theology, geology, uh, literature, physics, mathematics, bring back knowledge to architecture. All the interiors are made in a minimalist style, the color of the facade chosen from a variety of shades of blue. <laughs> but you see, you know, there are mysterious interstitial spaces here that intrigue you, that, uh, you know, uh, provoke you. This is what happens when you let some dreamers build. And look at the plants. There is geometry, there is rotation, there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is order here, but there is also the disorder uh, implicit in uh, these geometrical rotations and uh, you know the the concern with what is outside of the building itself which became becomes an integral part of the building not something you know like an afterthought a utopian dream stood still ricardo bofil postmodern parisian housing at noisy le grand now here becomes the here 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 enters the scene so to speak disaster in my opinion I have been here, I visited this, and I have to tell you, it's a, I think there are, I don't know very well how to put it, to improvise now some kind of a correct assessment. But I think when classicism entered uh, the, the healthy societal utopia of Ricardo Bofill that he manifested in Barcelona, uh, something bad happened, not in these buildings. These buildings he also built in Paris, and I have seen them, and these I liked, because they are not yet infused with um, so-called classicism, and they connect through their monumentality and their sculpturalness with the work in Barcelona. But unfortunately, this goes away, and, and he arrives here. And <laughs> You know, with all due respect, I think historicism uh, was fatal. Yeah, yes, you can be still impressed. Uh, I repeat, I had been here. I, 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 I saw these, these buildings uh, there in their place. Yes, you can be seduced to an extent, but I think this is heavy. Historicism makes them heavy. In a way, it's a contradiction to to unite classicism with modernism. You know, it depends what you need, mean by classicism. If you want to create a modern building that is classical or classic, it's okay, but not classicist. Classicism, I think, can be fatal in its interaction with, uh, with modernity. 
uh, perhaps any is. Uh, you know, this, this, this to me is an architecture that is not so different in its essence from Casa uh, Poporului in Bucharest, uh, Romania. You know, the same megalomania, the same uh, concern with, uh, you know, symmetry and uh, the dwarfing uh, uh, so-called power, which to me is actually a weakness. Uh, it's amazing to me that an architect like Bofil and his style of the architecture who did those, I would say very impressive and very valid works in Barcelona, indulge in this sort of thing, with this, ki this kind of dogmatic and institutionalized almost monumentality. Look at this uh, you know, gate here, you know, who needs this? I mean, the inhabitants of these uh, palace-like uh, uh, buildings are actually humble workers who take the subway in the morning and take the subway back from work in the evening. And they are certainly not emperors and empresses. Don't give them the illusion that they are because they are not going to buy it. They are not going to believe it. They are actually depressed. I read about this. People living here are depressed because they realize the distance between the, the pretense of the building and the reality, the actual re reality of the building. Look here, what is this? You know, uh, this emphatic, uh, apparently interesting volume, so to speak, and you know, this colonnade here, and in, but, but behind this, this fas glorious facade, who is living here, you know, in the eye of God? You know, probably, uh, who knows, you know, some, uh, worker in a somewhere in a, in, a, in a you know I'm not saying necessarily a factory but maybe a factory look look at this you know it's I really think I, I'm very surprised that Ricardo Bofil didn't understand that when he brought in so-called classicists he killed the freshness of his vision and their vision in Barcelona this was the effect of postmodernism, and uh, it, it was a disaster. In his later years, more recent to us, he got rid of, of, of this, but, but, uh, but he couldn't, something happened. I, I think something tragic, actually. He built a skyscraper in Chicago, which I have seen, and I don't know if I have it in this presentation. That one also very unconvincing. Uh, Look, really, Casa Poporului in, in Bucharest, uh, a little bit uh, changed with some so-called details, but in essence is about the same kind of, you know, royalist megalomania. Because the societal interests are gone here. Yes, we have a multitude of apartments, but you see they are not in individualized with the freedom that we witnessed in Barcelona plus these uh, monoliths, uh, monolithical, uh, uh, you know, imperial, uh, you know, elements that compose this building are telling uh, the story of non-democracy, actually. Yes, the drawings are still sensitive and nice, but look at the building. My God, my God, it's not open. This is not an open building. This is a self-enclosed building expressing dogma, the dogma of an is, maybe classicism, uh, misunderstood because classical art is really about equilibrium, about balance. But here I don't see equilibrium. It's a forced, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mimicked uh, equilibrium. Yes, with a lot of effort, some, uh, you know, so-called uh, interesting things happen, but they are still dogmatic and, uh, and uh, very rhetorical, you know. What is this? Is the Sun King living here? No, no, not at all. So let's, let's not uh, create illusions and delusions. Yes, uh, you know, reflections are always uh, modern in the sense that you know, they express ephemerality and uh, lack of clarity and so on. But the reality of a plus, look what's going on here. In a way, here is the whole truth about this building, meaning it's a lie. This building is a lie. 
is not real. And, and this is shown here. I mean, any architecture school that respects itself would laugh at this thing here because it's not truly uh, a joint. It, it, these two parts are not really joined through in this ridiculous way. I, I really don't know what happened to Ricardo Bofill and Taller de Arquitectura. There are different people here in France. They should have never left Barcelona. Uh, I don't know. There are protests. Uh, you know, I don't know what this picture is actually. I have been here. <laughs> I, I'm saying it again. It's a crashing architecture. As you can see, the people are still gathered there. Maybe, I don't know, some kind of, a, you know, a carnival or event. But the building is aloof. It is far away. It is crashing them. It is uh, now Montigny, Les Arcades du Lac et le Viaduc. Yes, it, you know, you could say, sure, you know, Le Du, Boulet, centrality, authority, revolution, uh, the 18th century, the early 19th century, we have uh, the lake, we have the sky, and we have uh, the nostalgia for an order which the emperor brought to us. But what do you do with the revolutionaries? He used to be a revolutionary. He was expelled from the school. What, is, what happened to him? He became a lover of authority, all of a sudden, look here, a retired old man contemplating the majestic, uh, you know, uh, palace. Um, an impossible dream in a way, and in a way sad. But, well, being built, you know, in the proximity of water is probably pleasant, but the, the, the ideology of the building is not one that encourages, uh, in my opinion, fresh thinking and openness and so on. No, no, postmodernism was a, was a terrible fatality and it affected many people. Les Arcades du Lac is an apartment building. The project is located, okay, we know this. Uh, and uh, look, look at this. You know, it's very demagogical, but very static. This is not a dynamic building. No, this was built by an old man, although he was not so old when he built it, uh, but with an old mentality, he, he grew old. Instead of growing younger, as Le Corbusier asked us to do when he said the problem in life is not to remain young, but to become young, I think Ricardo Bofill became old with this kind of architecture. He changed a little bit later, you know, in, in, in more recent years. But um, now, who knows? This is my interpretation today. Who knows? Well, maybe from, uh, I don't know, 20 years from now or 50 years from now, people would perceive them differently. But uh, I, I still think what they did in Barcelona was superior. These uh, historicist uh, references, uh, and look, these are these are common people, you know, people on the street, you know, with problems, with paying them, paying the bills, and so on. You know, why do you give them these imperial things? That there, there is no Caesar living here, no, no Roman emperor. What are you doing to these people? Don't give them the illusion of grandeur because they don't need it. Postmodernism in Paris. Well, near Paris. Le Temple du Lac. And look at this. You know. I, I mean, you know, what what temple? You know, maybe if this was built, you know, bought or built for IBM or uh, who knows what uh, big, uh, uh, you know, corporation. Uh, but still, uh, it, it would have, it would have been uh, also abhorrent. What is this nonsense? No, <laughs> I can only say no, I'm sorry. Yes, you can still take some interesting pictures like here because always where you have a reflection, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. But look at this poor man, you know. It's again, you know, he, he, he 
he's not a former emperor and he is not a present emperor. He's a lonely man, a retired man with a small pension contemplating the end of life. And you offer him these temples, these demagogical temples. No, sorry, Mr. Bofil, but you got it completely wrong here. And also marrying these giant windows, a lot of glass with a temple-like, uh, uh, you know, cubicle structure, also it doesn't work. So again, he got it completely wrongly uh, with his attempt to marry so-called classicism with modernism. No, it's in the very essence of modern, modernity or what is modern to, to not be classical. In other words, to not be frozen. It has to be open, moving. Uh, Charles Baudelaire, and there are 200 years since his birth this year, understood very well the essence of art. He said art has two halves. One half is about the permanent, the, the eternal, the immutable, and the other half is about the, uh, the transitory, the ephemeral, the circumstantial. And that second half is about modernity. That he should have kept because he had it as in his first works in Barcelona even before Walden Seven, but not here. Classicism and historicism killed um, or all wounded severely Ricardo Bofil. Look, this is, this is almost what Romania experienced, but of course with a higher level of so-called sophistication and other financial means, but the same kind of grandeur that uh, Ceausescu wanted in the boulevard leading to um, so-called Casa of the House of the Republic or whatever, is the same kind of, in, 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 in its essence, is the same kind of architecture. Or here, you know, I almost said something very non-academic, but I, I, you know, I almost said to hell with classicism. I love classical art, I love classical architecture, but I don't love classicism as understood by someone living in the 20th century in this way. Now, look, look at this. I like much more what I see here than what I see here. What is this? Or what is it saying? Or this? Or this? Ah, Bofield. <laughs> what does Victoria doing here, you know, some of that? What is it doing here, really? Antigone district, uh, you know, what is this? You know, St. Peter's Square in front of the Vatican. Wow, what is all of this? You know, this rigid axis, what is it doing? I, I have to rush in order to arrive at the liberating drawings of um, uh, Yakov Chernikov, whom uh, Bernard Schumi loved. Yes, the drawing is nice, I agree, but he didn't do the drawing and I, it, it would have been nice if it remained at the level of the drawing, like this. But when it's built, in my opinion, uh, is, is, is something that, uh, it's, 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 it's fake. In my opinion, it's fake. Everything I see here is fake. This is the skyscraper in Chicago, if you can believe it. Well, what is going on there at the top, really? I mean, I'm sorry, but Mies was much better. The, you know, he, he, he didn't have to, uh, you know, mimic Mies, of course, but he could have mimicked himself from the early years in Barcelona. Let's read one of the more colorful figures in architectural history was the 15th century Florentine financier, Giovanni Rucellai, the third richest man in Florence. He was the money behind Leon Battista Alberti's designs for Palazzo Rucellai and the facade of Santa Maria Novella. But he also was behind one of my favorite uh, maxims. Men have two roles. That's what Bofil wrote. The first is to procreate and the second is to build. And man builds to honor God and to bring glory to his city and his family. 
<laughs> and somebody wrote, Ricardo Bofil has certainly done that. Which one, to procreate or to build for God? I don't think he built for God. Maybe, maybe in his early works, but not what he did in Paris. In 1976, I mean, uh, with the exception of those uh, sculptural uh, modernistic buildings that he built, and we saw a picture of, was commissioned by the Société des Autoroutes du Sud-Est de la France to build this monument on the Catalan highway border between Spain and France. Sorry, I see it's missing. So 1976, and this is the landscape and this is the monument. He was, uh, you know, here I could almost accept it. Although even this one is rather rhetorically placed here, you know, uh, uh, on top of a geometrized hill, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, in my opinion, too emphatic, you know. <laughs> but uh, the man was carried away by his, uh, you know, I think he had it in himself, the royalist uh, uh, tendencies. I wish he had it more uh, the anarchist, but uh, no. I, yes, there are some rotations here in the columns, uh, which, you know, uh, bring a little bit of movement, but only a little bit. Otherwise, it's very stiff and symmetrical. And uh, I'm glad he twisted these columns. Yes, this, this saves the saves the work, but uh, it's too, too obstinate for my taste. Now, of course, what I say is in, in part at least uh, subjective. National, sorry, another letter missing, National Theatre of Catalonia, another disastrous building built in Barcelona. Look at this. Now, really, he became very dogmatic using so-called classical columns and then this, uh, you know, high-tech, uh, almost high-tech glass walls. I don't really think they go together very well. And uh, or not in this way, you know, this, this, it is stiff, it is rigid, it is um, conveniently, you know, so-called pleasing. But now we arrive at the last work that I show, it's a more recent work, and this one I like. He got rid of the, you know, uh, so-called marrying uh, classicism with the modernity, and he returned to something that connects with his early works in Barcelona. Uh, and here it is, a sketch, uh, you know, uh, moderately you know, sensitive, and uh, here is a, you know, a rendering of the, uh, or maybe even a model, uh, what is done with computers. But we see a return of the, of, although he uses symmetry and squares, but a return to the, you know, the more intimate courtyard and small units. Here again is we. I see multiplicity in unity, and not just that. Uh, contrived, forced, uh, you know, uh, additive uh, multitude uh, forced into a unity. And, uh, you know, it's an architecture is influenced by its time. There are some references here, you know, on one hand to, you know, the, the power of the world in that, in that country, in that culture, but also I see here some some references perhaps to the cemetery in Modena by Aldo Rossi. Uh, it's, it's, it's an architecture. Yes, he still, here is the return of the windows that he had in Barcelona in his factory. But there are here, I think, I think this architecture, because it got rid of that, uh, you know, uh, French uh, classicism imported uh, in a dubious way. I think I think uh, there are things that are acceptable, at least acceptable, maybe more than acceptable, maybe. There are some touches of so-called classicism, but they are abstracted. He got rid of historicism in good measure, and that is that is, that was a positive uh, step forward. Um, 
here we see some reflections, some echoes, a little bit from the Waldo Seven and those um, those buildings he built in Barcelona, near Barcelona, in the proximity of his working place. It's a little better, I think, than than what he built uh, in Paris or near Paris. But then again, I don't know why he. Uh, he tried to show that he can also do buildings that actually are not, uh, uh, well, in my opinion, what I look at here is inferior to what uh, Miss van der Rohe did. But, uh, you know, <laughs> as it is said, we become what we hate. Uh, so there is, there are echoes or, uh, you know, of, of a certain rationalism here not everywhere in particularly in this kind of building on the left anyway built in morocco in his later years it's a university a polytechnical university mohammed Okay, and now we go to a shorter presentation. I will be over with this presentation today in about uh, 10, 15 minutes. Let's present the case of this architect who didn't build a lot. In fact, there is just one uh, building that is still alive. Maybe other buildings were built and destroyed, uh, but still an architect who drew incessantly and who inspired some architects today, like I said, uh, Bernard Chumi, among others. He died at 62, Yakov Chernikov. Uh, I, I couldn't find the good resolution pictures of him. Here is a picture, if you can see a little bit. Um, I'm sorry, that's all I found. There are others, but we, we then even um, more insufficient uh, resolution. Let's read Yakov Georgievich Chernikov, uh, born uh, on the 5th of December 9, 1889 in Pavlograd uh, in the Russian Empire. Now it's in Ukraine. And he died in May 1951 in Moscow, Soviet Union, was a constructivist architect and graphic designer. His books on architectural design published in Leningrad between 1927 and 1933 are amongst the most innovative texts and illustrations of their time. Chernikov was born to a poor family, one of 11 children. After studying at the Grekov, Grekov Odessa Art School, Ukraine, he moved in 1914 to Petrograd, St. Petersburg and joined the architecture faculty of the Imperial Academy of Arts in 1916, where he later studied under Leon Benoit. Greatly interested in futurist movements, including constructivism and the suprematism of Malevich, with whom he was acquainted, he set out his ideas in a series of books in the late 1920s and early 1930s, including the Art of Graphic Representation from 1927, Fundamentals of Contemporary Architecture, 1930, The Construction of Architectural and Machine Forms, 1931, and 101 Architectural Fantasies, 1933. The later, later, later a very fine example of color printing was perhaps the last avant-garde art book to be published in Russia during the Stalinist era. Its remarkable designs uncannily predict the architecture of the later 20th century. However, his unusual ideas meant that Chernikov was distrust, distrusted by the regime. Although he continued to work as a teacher and held a number of one-man shows, few of his designs were built and very few appear to have survived. Amongst the later, later is the Tower of the Red Nailer factory in St. Petersburg, and we are going to see it. Also, he was called the uh, Russian Piranesi. Chernikov also produced a number of richly designed architectural fantasies of historic architecture, which were never exhibited in his lifetime. 
a book on the construction of letter forms containing some of his typographical designs was published after his death in 1959. Chernikov produced some 17,000 drawings and drawings, drawings and projects, 17,000, and was dubbed the Soviet Piranesi. Sorry, the Soviet Piranesi. On, on August 8, 2006, it was announced that some hundreds of Chernikov's drawings with an estimated value of $1,300,000 had gone missing from the Russian state archives. Some 274 had been recovered in Russia and abroad. Now let's look at this tower, Tower of the Red Nailer factory in St. Petersburg, uh, depicted in February 2006. You would say nothing's uh, you know, exceptional here, but uh, you know, uh, at the time when it was built, I guess, uh, you know, it has a certain modernistic purity that matter. Here is the drawing that he made for this tower. This is the only building by him that, um, you know, we, we will show tonight, but we'll show some, some drawings and renderings of so-called uh, fantastic architectures or fantasist architectures. Some of them though, with some historical uh, uh, references, maybe a little bit too obvious. Anyway, this is one of the buildings. I mean, it's, it might be that it's the only building still alive by Yakov Chernikov. And you know that the spirit of architecture somehow remains alive even when the building is destitute and uh, not in good shape. Drawings, and I just show here a collection of his drawings, not, uh, not in a chronological order, maybe not even in a stylistic order, but I'll show about 30 or 40 drawings that he produced. So-called, uh, you know, fantasist or fantastical drawings, modernistic, most of them, but not all of them. There are some interesting ideas here. I mean, you know, if you are to uh, contemplate a certain part of the works of um, uh, Bernard Tumi, you might see some connections with some of these uh, drawings by, by Chernikov and others. Yes, there is futurism, there is, um, you know, the, the, the rhetorical aspect of modernity. Uh, you have to understand this man tried to <clears throat> honor his uh, aspiration to be an architect in whatever way he was able to do. And he produced, uh, as I read, a large number of drawings. And this is possible for anyone who has something to say, even if that someone doesn't have commissions or clients or whatever. This man contributed to the history of architecture in, in the way he was capable of, but he didn't give up architecture. And uh, this is important because it shows that you can do architecture even in the drone form that could have some meaning even later on, maybe even some significant years later on. Well, no, not all his uh, renderings or drawings are uh, equally inspired. So you, can, you can tell that he had uh, various influences, various kinds of, uh, he, he had maybe some doubts, but he kept working, he kept producing. He was dreaming of changing the world and society through architecture. Did he succeed? Perhaps not, but he didn't really fail or totally fail because uh, the very fact that we remember him today shows that he didn't actually. Uh, yes, there is, uh, you know, this part of his work, which is, uh, shows his uh, having his head turned backwards towards the past, but then he also has this side, which is, uh, you know, uh, looking forward in, in his own way. 
here again, <clears throat> we see nostalgia, we see history, uh, but we see a different kind of society and a different kind of ideology. The drawing, on the other hand, is rather romantically done, you know, in terms of its uh, technique and the colors he uses, as opposed to this drawing, which represents modernity. Outgoing. Yakov Chernikov. A belief in industry, a belief in uh, the tumultuous, tumultuousness of modernity and, uh, you know, factories and uh, technology and so on. Futuristically dynamic. We have seen this one already, sorry for uh, showing it twice. But you can see he had dualities, you know. We, I mean, after all, what does this uh, drawing have to do with this one? Like society, the society he lived in, it also had uh, dualities. On one hand, it wanted to create a new man, so to speak. And on the other hand, it returned to, you know, exhausted uh, forms of, uh, you know, uh, so social and political propaganda and, uh, you know, democracy and the new man turned into something else, the very opposite, unfortunately. So in this, in the dualities of uh, Chernikov, we see the dualities of, of, of society and of, of his time. This, this drawing is probably somehow the closest to a certain kind of so-called Soviet Piranesi. Influences from Kandinsky, perhaps. Okay, so um, let's wish him happy birthday.